and a particular welcome to anyone tuned into the podcast and listening to this uh, over the internet in about 500 years' time. Uh, you're, you're able to do this thanks to the extreme generosity of grateful alumni of the University of Birmingham through the circles of Lincoln the circles of um, voice coaching, uh, circles of influence campaign, uh, grateful alumni uh, to whom we are grateful in our turn. And uh, one of the reasons we're podcasting this afternoon in particular is that it's not only um, a great pleasure and a great um, potential intellectual resource to have uh, the artistic director of the RSC with us, but this is actually a great ceremonial moment in the life of the Institute, as for the first time in a while, uh, we take the major step of welcoming a new honorary senior research fellow. Um, Greg Doran, you must know, is not purely a personification of show business, uh, <laughs> but uh, through his commitment to what else goes into the swan apart from the plays of Shakespeare, through his commitment to the history of the organization which he now heads, uh, he has explored and made visible and researched drama for us uh, in the way uh, that I think matters most. And because he has been so conspicuously successful in his productions of plays set in Rome, the Titus Andronicus in South Africa, the wonderful Julius Caesar, which is about to go to New York, that brilliant Antony and Cleopatra with Patrick Stewart and Harriet Walter, uh, and the superb production of Johnson's Sejanus, a play many of us thought we'd never see, never mind enjoy. Um, <laughs> it, seemed, it seemed particularly appropriate that we should mark um, Greg's accession to the honor of uh, senior, uh, honorary senior research fellow uh, by crowning him with laurels. Uh, <laughs> laurels which were harvested this morning in my garden and which have been partly dried out, uh, and which I propose to place on stage there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. It's a <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know, mm. uh, when I was six years old and we went to um, the Costa Brava on holiday, um, I wanted to buy a sombrero <laughs> and there was a sombrero shop um, and I said I want that one and they tried out various sombreros on my head mm. but they had to go to the back of the shop to find one big enough mm. <laughs> uh, and this has been dogged me through my life mm. uh, and uh, all those feelings of embarrassment have just flooded back. <laughs> <laughs> no. But thank you very much. No, 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 it's, it's a pleasure. I've found my knee. Yeah, 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 yeah no, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's Julius Caesar's size, and, and it was the only, one, the only one we could do. Thank you. Uh, good. Um, much to talk about. I'm going to prod you with questions for a while and then, and then throw you to the mercy of, of these people. I mean, you've been doing press conferences about the next RSC winter <coughs> season almost continuously for the last 48 hours, so we might save that for a little later. Um, biographers have a kind of truism that in order to find out what somebody thought they were doing in their career, you need to reconstruct the world round about the time they were 18 and find great formative experiences that they've clung to or wanted to renew or wanted to go back to. Do you have particular recollections of theater when you were at that impressionable age that have, have sort of established in your mind what's desirable in the live theatre and what your own work has sought to I, repeat? I absolutely do. In fact, I know mm. the actual time and the date. <clears throat> I have a, a schoolboy diary for 1973, uh, and one August Thursday afternoon, um, my mum um, decided that we would come to Stratford. I think it was because we had a French student staying with us, and my mum thought we better take her to some culture, um, because we had certainly never been to Stratford-on-Avon before that. Um, and we went to see Eileen Atkins in As You Like It, directed mm. by Buzz Goodbody. Mm. Um, and uh, Maureen Lippman played Celia, um, Richard Pascoe played Jaquies. <clears throat> and I didn't know the play, and I, I'd never... I didn't, I think I'd had much experience of Shakespeare before that. I guess I was probably 13-ish. Um, and I, I came out of the theatre um, 
sort of dancing on a cl cloud of air mm. um, and turned to my mum as we, as we drove back up the M6 in her beige mini um, and said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. Mm. Um, and I guess that demonstrates a, a, a lack of imagination or a single-mindedness <laughs> um, that, that uh, pers persisted. Mm. Um, but we did, I mean, that was clearly a, a kind of formative mm. experience. Um, and I think we used to come down, I, I became quite a Shakespeare nut. We did do a Shakespeare play every year at school. Mm. Um, and I had uh, first managed to, I, I missed the role of Ophelia, which went to Gags Ronson, may he rot in hell. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, as it turns out, he's a doctor in Bristol now. He, <laughs> he did turn up at a book signing once and, and said, I'm, I, as I told the story of mm. Gags Ronson, he said, I'm Gags Ronson. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'd said rot in hell, though. Um, <laughs> and I played Lady Anne the following year in Richard III um, and then graduated to play oh, a number of things, including Richard II. Mm. Oddly enough, we may come back to that. Mm. Um, and, and then Lady Macbeth. And when I directed Macbeth with uh, Harriet on the press night, I gave her a photograph of me playing the part she was playing. And she said it was the weirdest first night card she'd ever had. <laughs> 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 um, so I guess, I guess by that point, I, I was becoming a genuine Shakespeare nut. And by the time Mrs. Thatcher came in um, and I had uh, come of age, I had managed to see every single Shakespeare play, except King John, which I had to wait for the BBC to do in the mm. early 80s. Mm. Um, and I, I, I think it would be almost impossible for, for a, a, certainly a young uh, boy growing up in, in Lancashire to, to do that now. But mm. we were able to go to the Duke's Playhouse, to the Bolton Octagon, to mm. Manchester Royal Exchange, to the Liverpool Everyman, even to a, 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 a an art centre in Southport, and mm. Shakespeare was coming at us from all sides. One day, uh, when I was an 18, uh, I saw three Macbeths in one day, <laughs> because uh, a touring production came to the school in the, in the morning, <coughs> which was um, so bad that we asked the actors to come back and tell us why. <laughs> um, because they actually dangled the... the, the the dagger in front of Macbeth's face on a fishing line. <laughs> um, and, and then he, he said, he said tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow so fast and so furiously because he was cleaning his, his sword. And so we asked him afterwards, well, why, why couldn't we hear that speech? And he said, well, it's much more important for Macbeth to be cleaning his sword. <laughs> and I, I thought, well, you, you kind of can't answer that. <laughs> um, uh, and then there was a, there was a uh, we went to see the Polanski film mm. at, at the ABC on Fishergate in the afternoon. Mm. And then in the evening, there was another production that was touring in the area, uh, which was a space age Macbeth. Mm. And I remember clearly Macduff receiving news of his wife's death over a sort of telecom <laughs> and going, what? All my pretty chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and their dam. <laughs> in one fell swoop. Mm. Uh, and I, I thought, I, uh, somehow, I survived that experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, apart from these two particular Macbeths, was there anything about the way Shakespeare was being done then that you feel has been lost or that you feel was especially <coughs> good? Well, the weird thing about the As You Like It, the Buzz Good Body As You Like mm. It, was working later on with, with Maureen Lippmann, she told me what an unhappy mm. production that had been. Mm. And that very shortly after that, Buzz, Buzz Goodbody committed suicide. Mm. Um, Buzz was the first, first woman ever to direct for the Royal Shakespeare Company, though not for the Stratford yeah. Theatre. Um, and I think she, you know, I, I, I learned that what comes over the footlights is not necessarily an expression of what's going on, mm. you know, within the company or backstage. Um, but there, there was a kind of, to me, I was, I was shocked and surprised by how modern this production was, and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't what I was expecting. Um, it, it wasn't in some kind of Tudor costume or mm -hmm. anything like that. Um, and that, that certainly impressed me, and it impressed me how each detail of the characters, as far as I could see them, were, had, was made to come alive. And it seemed to me 
that I have never heard anything spoken more beautifully mm. than Richard Prasco giving the Seven Ages of Man speech. Mm. Um, so I, I guess hearing the, just hearing what that language could do mm. to your soul, as it were, as you were watching it, that, that's what made the deepest impression, unlike Macbeth cleaning his sword. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, you do have a reputation among directors for actually thinking actors should understand what they're saying, <laughs> uh, which, you know, which, which I, hope, I hope you'll keep. Um, and and um, you know, it does bring us to the question of what the relation is between studying the text, you know, table work, which you know, goes on in here quite a lot, um, and the study of Shakespeare, the study of Shakespeare's period, and the business of actually realizing it in front of modern audiences. Um, here we are in Stratford with this, this institute that was set up partly as a result of conversations with Barry Jackson mm. um, that was always intended to be a kind of um, memory bank and, and lab for, for, for the theatre. Uh, and obviously we hope you'll be here often asking us how to do things. Mm. Um, we have a, I mean, one project we might mention that I'm you know, obviously very interested in is uh, the Scholar's Pitch project, project mm. by which under the guidance of, of Dr. Wiggins and others, uh, 16 hither, you know, not much revived plays will be gradually whittled down for one which we hope to see in The Swan. What do you hope to bring to uh, the kind of audience that comes to Stratford by putting in front of them shows that nobody has seen for 400 years? What's your aspiration in this? Well, I guess you know, when, when we did uh, a season of Jacobethan plays uh, in the Swan a few years ago, um, I, my sort of take, I guess, was I had read a lot of these plays and thought they're really terribly good, mm. but was met with an absolute kind of brick wall of prejudice to say uh, a kind of automatic cliche was trotted out, which is if they haven't been done for 400 years, they are no good. Mm. Um, and I realized just how... Um, short-sighted that was, and that if you looked at, for instance, the restoration plays that we now regard as absolutely part of the, the, mm. the, the canon of plays, which we always knew were good, you look back at a, a restoration season involving Gielgud, um, where those plays were done for the first time and are now always yeah. done, um, yeah. that before that they had been done very little. Mm. Um, and I guess looking at the plays and, and thinking these plays really do They've uh, received a lot of academic attention. Mm. Um, uh, I think they're, they're great. Maybe the thing to do, instead of sprinkling them occasionally through the RSC Swan repertoire, would be to go, well, let's, why don't we put them together so you'll know none of them mm. and, and just see mm. what, what happens. Um, and if they were cast right and they were directed uh, in a vivid or lively fashion, then, then maybe they would catch fire, mm. which they did. Um, mm. And that gave me not only a lot of um, confidence in them, but a, a degree of credibility to be able to do it again. Mm. Um, and I suppose, um, partly from that, I would get uh, a lot of scholars would, would um, or academics would write to me and say, and then uh, probably Martin was one of them, um, why haven't you done Hengist, King of Kent? Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I decided that mm. maybe the thing to do uh, and, uh, and Martin and I had a, sat down and had a conversation about this, was to, uh, as indeed you and I did, um, to say, well, let's turn this round and, and, and let um, the academics come forward with uh, four plays each. Mm. Uh, and instead of pitching them to me and saying why, why and haranguing me, as it were, <laughs> um, um, they could do what I would have to do, which is persuade actors that these parts are good, mm persuade them that the play itself would stand up. Um, and so the, the idea is that um, each, each, direct, each uh, academic comes up with these four plays. Uh, I give them six actors and a, and a, and a director. They do a, a sort of play a day. And at the end, they choose one of those to pitch to everybody else. So mm. on the final day, with a group of perhaps 30 actors and six directors and whoever else comes along, um, they get the chance to, to pitch which is the best, which is the best of those plays. Mm. Um, and I think it does, e the, the, you know, which is pitched uh, in the end is not in a way as important as, as airing these plays mm. among <laughs> actors and, and directors and taking the, the curse off them to some extent. Yeah. Because I, you know, I, I know that, I remember 
I was in the new inn, Ben Johnson's new inn, um, in, in, when I joined the company as an actor in Stratford. And I remember just being sent to the play before I joined the company to say, and play this part. And you read through with no synopsis or breakdown of characters and, and, and maybe very little experience of, of reading Ben Johnson. And it just not only felt like a foreign language, it felt as though it was interminable. It, would, it was completely incomprehensible. <laughs> Um, and I remember sitting uh, on, on, a, on a beach with Deborah Finley, who had also been offered it, going, I don't know what <laughs> is going, who is this? Um, and I realized that, you know, we, are, we need to be able to provide, when we send out these plays, we need to send out a, a package that actually helps people read through plays that, they, that are, in a, are in a language that is unfamiliar yeah. unless you read it all the time. Yeah, yeah. So the script will just arrive with Martin. Yeah, With yeah, yeah, from now on. Yeah. Just come along. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no that's, that's very good. Um, your own, you, know, you, you, you mentioned the fact that, that, of course, you first came to the RSC as an actor, and, and you know, it's, it's, again, it's a, a very optimistic sign, I think, that we have, again, an artistic director who actually know what it's like, knows what it's like to act. Did you find something distinctive about the culture of the RSC compared to other acting jobs when you got here? Is there, is there an identity in the way in which plays are put on in Stratford compared to how they happen in other places? Uh, absolutely. Um, mm. In two very different ways, I guess. One of which was with people like Sis Berry and the, the, the voice department and perhaps John Barton, if he was around, um, that uh, there, was a, there was a real support system for the, for the basic training of being able to um, speak the text and indeed project it. Um, but I think two very different experiences for me, which uh, I think perhaps have informed how I now do it, uh, was being in two different plays. I, was, I played Solanio um, in The Merchant of Venice, uh, one of the so-called salad roles, <laughs> Solanio and Solario and sometimes even Salarino. Um, <laughs> And I guess they were my salad days as well. <laughs> um, and I played uh, Octavius Caesar and Julius Caesar, um, and the servant who comes in and tells uh, Caesar not to go to the Capitol. Um, and in one of the plays, I, I felt so invested, so invited to take part, um, that I thought the play was called The Merchant of Venice and His Friend Salam. <laughs> um, uh, whereas the other player, I really had no idea what I was, what I was doing, or really what I was saying. Hmm. And I remember walking around in the scene uh, 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 before uh, uh, Philippi, um, and the blocking just seemed to be that we walked around in circles, hmm. and Roger Allen was playing Brutus. And one wet Wednesday afternoon, I just completely forgot <laughs> my lines. I, or I, I forgot what I was even talking about. <laughs> Um, and I did what I think the Shakespearean um, world, the Elizabethan word uh, for improvising was, I, I, I tried to fribble <laughs> and, and fribbled through a dense piece of text. And every time Roger Allen walked downstage with me and looked upstage at where I was desperately blushing my way mm. through this experience, he would go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, at which point I gave up acting. Yes, <laughs> really. Uh, but the, the difference, mm. the very different approach was that I realized that you would get the best out of the entire team if everybody knew, not just, you know, if you have a reading on the first day and you, these plays are, after all, written hierarchically, you know, um, uh, if it's, if it's a, a Iago and a fellow have, have half, if not even mm. more, percentage of the lines. Um, Brutus and, and Cassius have, have certainly <coughs> half, half the lines of Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. If you do a reading on the first day and you are playing the servant who brings the news in to Caesar, you kind of realize very quickly how small your part <laughs> is and therefore how potentially how small your contribution to the whole is. Mm -hmm. And that can make you feel less inclined to give of your, of your all to it, if you like. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that informed the process that I, that I always now pursue, where we sit around for the first week at least, um, and we read the play around the table, and mm. nobody reads their own lines. Mm. Um, 
you're not allowed to read your own lines. We read through and we turn the entire play into our own words. Mm -hmm. And what happens is a, a, a line or a, 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 that you thought you knew what it meant, somebody will paraphrase it completely differently mm. to what you had expected it to be. And the, what happens by sort of process of osmosis is, is the entire company begin to understand what the play is about and have an attitude to it and have a kind of sense of investment in it because you playing third spear carrier on the right may have informed how Hamlet mm. actually mm. delivers that line. Mm. Um, and I, I guess those were two, they came out of, of, a, of a process of being part to, of two productions that had two completely different approaches in terms of um, how they regarded the actor's involvement. Mm. And presumably it's specifically in order to prevent Roger Allen being able to have his back up to the audience and pulling a funny face at you that the, that the auditorium's been remodelled the, way, the way it has. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an enormous structural change that, that you've in, inherited as artistic director and you are presumably involved in uh, the decisions about it when, when it went through. What's your experience been like so far of working in that space, and in, indeed in the courtyard, compared to um, the old RST? The old RST, I mean, it, it was very interesting because it was gradually more and more um, actors who came to Stratford didn't want to work in the RST, they wanted to work in the Swan, mm. um, or they wanted to work in TOP. Um, my first experience, that, that as you like it, I, I guess I must have been pretty near to the back in the gods, and you were an awful long way from the actors. Um, and I think the process from the audience's point of view was one that audiences expected more and more because of television, film, and studio Shakespeare, and studio theater, to be closer to the action, to see the, uh, you know, the smiles on people's faces, the reactions, the, the nuance of, of reaction. Um, and it was, it was also harder and harder to, to get the, the plays to project out there. Now, you could say many, many people have had many wonderful experiences in, in the old RST, mm. and of course that is true. Mm. But you would also have to say that from the moment it opened, uh, the history of that theatre was one of trying to, to, to rectify the mm. actor-audience relationship. And I think when The Swan opened in, in 1986, I joined the company in 1987, so I, mm. I was in the second season in The Swan, it was such a revelation, not only in terms of how you did, um, how you could react to the audience and how the play was a much more fluid experience between actor and audience, um, but that the play somehow lived in a different way. And I remember being the assistant director to, to Terry Hands on uh, Romeo and Juliet, and, mm. and Mark Rylance was playing Romeo, and it, Terry was doing a, a, a workshop, or, no, not a workshop, a rehearsal, uh, with Juliet in the Swan on the poison speech. And she was looking at the poison and saying, what if this be a poison the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead? And Terry said, who are you talking to? Mm. And she said, well, myself. Mm. And he said, and who are all these people sitting mm. in all these seats? Mm. And she said, the audience. <laughs> and he said, no, they're your, they're your friends. They are your confidants. They're your sounding boards. Uh, speak to them. Talk, mm. Draw them in. So she, suddenly she went, what if this be a poison? The friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead. And I sitting there went, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was, a, to me, an absolutely vital experience because mm. it meant that instead of just sitting back in the darkness, in a cross arch space, as it were, and thinking, oh, poor soul, you know, she's having a tough time, isn't she? Mm. I, I felt implicated, complicit, mm. uh, engaged. Um, and so I think that, that actor-audience relationship and the way that perhaps a lot of the... Um, a lot of the soliloquies were more shared, perhaps, than just seen as, as a, ref, a, ref, a reflection. Um, that seemed to be why the, we, should, we, should, we should have a, a thrust aid one-room space um, mm. for the RST. At the end of Adrian Noble's regime, the whole process had been to knock down the old theatre and build mm. a, an entirely new mm. uh, sort of egg on Avon, I think, I <laughs> remember. 
Um, and the, uh, many people rebelled against that because of sort of the ghosts in the walls, I guess. Mm. But the process of, dis of thinking that the best theatre space would be what we had then tried out in the courtyard and transforming that to the main house seemed to me to be a, an excellent um, progression. And indeed, from my point of view now, as now I, 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 I've landed the, the I've been can somebody said I've been canonized. <laughs> and I said, I think you have to be martyred before you're canonized. <laughs> I guess that will come. Um, but putting, but having a, a London home and being able to replicate the, the same experience we are able to give Stratford audiences to, to London mm. audiences. Um, and how, it, 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 nobody's saying it, it's easy. I mean, mm. I remember David Tennant as, as Hamlet saying how he loved playing it in the courtyard because it was like a 3D experience mm. that you shared your existential angst mm. Mm. with this entire body of, around you. And then when, when he played it, uh, albeit for a brief time, mm. like, <laughs> at the Novello uh, uh, in London, um, in the Pross Arts, you just had to play it that way. And it, that was, he said, you know, it's much easier doing mm. it that way, but it's much more fulfilling doing mm. it that way. Mm. Um, but it isn't a space that is automatically easy to play, nor is it a space that most people are trained in, either mm. as actors or directors. Mm. And I freak, I'm going to the first preview of, of Winter's Tale tonight, mm. and I know there's going to be a book, there was a point on the first preview of, of, of The Merry Wives of Windsor saying, you can't put the buck basket there, yeah. all those people can't see. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and you, there are certain things you have, to, you have to work out and you have to acknowledge and you have to use the diagonals and, mm. and all those things. And I think that's a continuing process of, of learning. Mm. Um, and I think we'll still carry on learning how to, to use that space. But it, it's one of the things that makes RSC in Stratford uh, sort of unique, basically. Mm. Um, and it's, it's what we should try and replicate in, 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 in London. Yeah. Well, it's nice, uh, it's nice to hear somebody from the RSC talking about London <laughs> rather than just taking little things down there for short runs because it was a huge event in the company's history when it got a permanent London base and actors could come to Stratford and know that they would be seen by casting agents because yeah. the, the whole lot was, was going down there again, a whole package of a repertory season. Yeah. Are we on the eve of seeing something like that happening again? Is that at least an aspiration? It, uh, it is. Uh, uh, you know, I think when we left the Barbican, and there were many good reasons why I think that decision was made, um, but what we did was cut down a tree in the forest, and in the clearing that was left behind, a lot of shrubs have grown <laughs> for light. Um, and if we don't get back <laughs> yeah. to that ecology, we'll no longer be necessary to that ecology. Yeah. And we're a national company, and we should be seen in the nation's capital. Yeah. Um, but I think you know, we're taking Richard II back to the Barbican. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there were a lot of people threw their hands up in horror that that was the, you know, my, almost <laughs> my first thing to do as the, as the artistic director. It's not signaling a return to the Barbican. It's signaling that the that the, we need the best space for Shakespeare. That's the best place available for that show. But um, we do need a London home. One of the difficulties of the, having the Barbican fall all year round was that it was lengthening the contracts of the mm. actors so that it was, you know, your minimum contract was sort of, a, a minimum equity contract was 60 weeks and we were needing at least a year and a half to fulfill the repertoire in both places. Mm. Um, the, the, the sort of what was described by one journalist as the gypsy life that we've led <laughs> since then in London um, um, has been, I think, most detrimental in that we tend only to take uh, the Shakespeare. Yeah. And I think the context in which we do Shakespeare with all those other plays is, is one of the most interesting things. I, I, in fact, have not had a production at the Roundhouse, which is one of our mm. more permanent spaces, uh, more regular spaces, I should say, I, I know, I have to say, I know the mice backstage in at least 10 West End theatres, because uh, there are 10 West End theatres where, where my productions have mm. been um, performed over the last decade. Mm. And I'm sick of sort of um, professionally sleeping on other people's floors. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I want our own home back. No. So I think that is a, it's a priority f f for me. How we do it, how we schedule the repertoire, um, 
how we sometimes have longer co contracts and shorter contracts, that's, that's uh, up in the air as to you know, what the working model will actually be. But having that home, I think, mm. is, uh, is vital. Yeah, yeah, good. I was, I was deeply shocked uh, the other night, there was that Shakespeare in Schools reception oh, yes. in Downing Down Street, Street yes. and, and, and people say, oh, Stratford. Yeah, well, I, I love the RSC's work, but I've never been to Stratford. You know, I mean, there, there's a huge influential London bunch of people who just see stuff in London yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. don't think there's anything beyond the end of the tube line yeah, and, and, yeah. and uh, they, they're going to see things. Uh, tell me about Richard II. You're not, n I mean, it's, apart from that brilliant King John, you I haven't much been associated with the histories, which have been felt to have been Michael Boyd territory. Well, I, I haven't been able to get near them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've done the book ends. I, the mm. first Shakespeare mm. I ever directed for Stratford was All is True, the Henry VIII mm. play mm. Uh, in The Swan. Mm. Um, and indeed, I did King John. Um, mm. And I, I'd long, I've been longing to do the, mm. the, the, the plays. And I realized that every artistic director, um, pretty much anyway, has to some extent identified or defined their tenure, mm. that's ten year rather than <laughs> ten year, um, as uh, with the histories. Mm. Um, way back with Peter Hall and John Barton with mm. the Wars of the Roses, mm. Trevor, interestingly, at the Barbican, did, did, he did Henry Form 1 and 2 at the Barbican, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, mm. but significantly mm. did not do mm. um, the Henry Sixes. Mm. Uh, Terry did a, a, a very fine trilogy of Henry VI, yes. um, and of course did all the histories with, with Alan Howard playing mm. all the kings. Mm. Um, Adrian Noble did the Plantagenets, mm. and Michael, of course, did his complete history mm. cycle. Mm. Great chutzpah doing, mm. directing all of them in mm. one mm. go, which is amazing feat. Um, I guess what I want to do is, is look at the plays, but without sort of the tetralogy mentality. Mm. Um, I don't think Richard II really was conceived as part of a, a cycle. I think, um, I think it, was, it was just a, a great, one of the great stories from history that, that, mm. that he wanted to tell. Um, and it interests me. I once, in a very, very nerdy Shakespearean way, which probably only people in this room would, would, would understand. Um, I, I went through all the kings and queens of England from, from William the Conqueror and discovered I could, only f I could only find one king who had not appeared on the, the, the Elizabethan Jacobean stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was, I think that was Henry III. <laughs> every other king appears in some play. Mm -hmm. So the fact that uh, Shakespeare chooses Richard II um, I, I thought that was a, a really fascinating. What we did decide we might do, and we're still trying to find a way of doing this, is, is do a presentation of Thomas Woodstock, the mm. Richard II mm. part mm. one, mm. which explains the, the death of the Duke of Gloucester, which always seems a bit baffling when you see Richard II and you go, S who, mm. who was that? Well, just as you're getting to know everybody's names and who mm. everybody is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's a delight to be able to to do it, and I will be able to give David Tennant a picture of me playing the part at school. Oh, so there you are. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it worked for Harry. It worked for Harry. Yeah. Why, is it, why is it not going to work for David? Yeah. Uh, do you have any notions of, of what sort of visual or interpretive things you might do with Richard II yet, or is, are, are we too uh, early for it's, that? It's kind of early days, but one of the mm. things that I, I, I try um, just to kind of sitting around the play a bit like you know, sitting around an, a Ouija board or something and, and trying to detect its force field or, or, or seeing how the images strike me and, and rather than thinking, shall I set it in its period, should we do it this, should we do it modern, should we do it... Um, and one of the things that struck me from a, just a, a very simple physical point of view was the sort of verticality mm. of the play that um, Richard always seems to be elevated. Mm. He descends at the mm. lists in Coventry and mm. Coventry to, to, to embrace the, the dualists. Um, he comes back from Ireland and he flops mm. onto the ground and mm. sits on the ground and, 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 and you know, um, um, begs it, the, the earth, to, to help him. Um, then, of course, he goes to the top of Flint Castle mm. and has the glorious speech mm. about down I come like mm. glistering fair and wanting the marriage of unruly jades into the base court. Mm. So this sense of the wheel of fortune and the mm. up and down. And then of course his final scene is in the depths of mm. the dungeon of Pomfret Castle. Um, so that intrigues me as a, as a, as a sort of 
status, um, mm. if you like, um, apart from anything else, and, and an insistence on that status. And funnily enough, when, uh, when I was working on the Boris Godunov uh, script with Adrian Mitchell, we were looking at um, the contemporary accounts of Boris Godunov's coronation um, in, in Moscow. And um, he, when he was crowned, they, in the Kremlin, there are three cathedrals um, very close together. And they processed from cathedral to cathedral, but on these raised platforms, which were covered with sort of mm. carpets and gold cloth and what have you. Mm. So Boris himself, in, the, in his new role as Tsar, never, his feet never touched the ground. Mm. Um, and then as soon as they had passed through each of the three cathedrals, the, the populace fell on these cloths and ripped them and had their own little bit of these the cloths. Mm. And I thought that was a very interesting telling demonstration of, of, um, of, of majesty and, uh, and how majesty is allowed to be elevated in that way. Mm. And that, that's given us a sort of physical idea of, 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 of how Richard sees himself and, mm. on, and his journey round that inevitable Wheel of Fortune. Mm. Um, so that's, that's, that's where we're, we're starting. And then it's up to David Tennant's legs and whether, what it will look good <laughs> in. <laughs> Do you have any uh, notions as to what kind of Bolingbrook you might want? Is it going to be one of those Bolingbrooks who looks suspiciously like Richard or one of, or of a know, different the first, generation? The first, or? Um, the first Richard, the second I, I saw, just before uh, my um, English master suggested that I play the part mm. at school, was, um, was the alternating... Mm -hmm. um, John Barton production where Ian Richardson and Richard Pascoe uh, alternated mm. the parts. Um, and what was really interesting about that, in fact, was that it was unconnected to the sort of tetralogy mentality. Mm. It looked at the play yeah. Yeah. as simply a great lyric tragedy. Yeah. Um, and and I, I was very persuaded by, by that duality, by, by, as it were, mm. the reflection of the king's two bodies. Um, mm. and, and then I suppose maybe the tetralogy mentality makes you think this guy is turning into Henry the Fourth. watch out. Mm -hmm. um, but it, 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 I think it more relies on, if, if, from my point of view, and I always start with casting, to me, we directors are pretty, you know, we, we, we happen to hold um, the reins, mm -hmm. um, but it's the actors who are, are out there doing it. So I, I believe in what Tyron Guthrie said when he said, you know, directing is 80% good casting. Yeah. So you really, I will match the Bolingbrook to David. Right. Um, Do you know if Matt Smith's free? Yeah. I think he's still got a bit of tardis. Duty. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I know. He's yeah. probably busy. Yeah. Uh, this would be a point to open it up to the floor, it seems to me. Um, does anyone out there have um, a brilliant, vibrant, relevant question? Joy? I don't know whether it's brilliant, but I, my first production of Shakespeare was 75 years ago. <laughs> And the great difference I find in then and now was the beautiful verse speaking. I had John Gilbert, Rod Smithier, Donald Crawford, and the lack of scenery. Hmm. Nowadays we get these enormous sceneries. And, well, you know, I don't think Shakespeare needs it. No. Hmm. And that the acting and the words will take through. And I hope that. Your <laughs> well, I think it shouldn't need scenery. Should it? <laughs> I think that's the difference. I, I, I think, yeah, no, if you look at you know, the opening of the mm. prologue to Romeo and Juliet, it says, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you should be able to imagine Verona without it trucking on stage at that point. <laughs> but, um, and I do think, you know, I did an Antony Cleopatra in The Swan. Mm. Uh, and to me, the swan is a, is a magic space because it can be both epic and intimate and allows that, that, that moving in and out of the camera that Shakespeare's text requires. Mm -hmm. And it also means that you know, that particular play is a chamber play. It just happens to invite the sort of, the kind of monumental Cleopatra, Elizabeth Taylor mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, treatment. And too often, Rome comes trucking on the stage mm -hmm. and then Egypt comes trucking on the stage. And it, apart from the fact it makes the play awfully long, mm -hmm. um, it's not it really isn't necessary because if Cleopatra's on the stage, you sort of know you're in Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I agree with you. Uh, in terms of verse speaking, I think verse, I think verse speaking has always changed. And I think mm -hmm. what Gielgud 
uh, was, was, was doing, and Olivier certainly was doing, was something that was radically different from the generation before them. If you listen to Ben Greet, mm -hmm. old recordings, mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's amazing what sounds they're making, because they're really singing the text, mm -hmm. the, the sort of Ben Greets before them, in a way that is largely because of the size of the house that they're filling, or Bur Beerbun Tree is filling mm -hmm. this huge, huge theatre at the bottom of the Haymarket. Um, and, and therefore, it's, you play it to, to you know, students now, or at young actors now, or anybody, frankly, and they, they cannot believe that the sense has gone so far away from, from the sort of cadence and the rhythm of it. Gilbert and, and, and Olivier, of course, sound much, much closer to, to natural speech. And I think the whole process has been a, the degree to which you marry the two traditions. You, you marry the sort of sense with the musicality. I think it's gone too far one way, and I think mm. the musicality, as long as it's not musicality for its own sake, because the words will, should do it for you if you, if you allow them to. Um, I, you know, a lot of the work I do, I guess, with, um, when I do workshops with each of the companies that come in, is to take uh, a piece of, um, a piece of Shakespeare's text and make them first of all understand it and then realize how much more there is uh, that Shakespeare is giving you in, in the way he has structured the sentence. You know, taking that prologue to Romeo and Juliet, um, uh, two house elves, both like an dignity and fair, but only way below our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny. The, the crashing together of those consonants gives you a sense of that. Mm -hmm that new mutiny and the mm. struggle that's going on. But if you, if you don't hear that, if, you're, if you have cloth ears and can't hear what's going on there, it makes it very difficult. I, I, I always give them a piece of Alexander Pope um, in his essay on criticism. And, and he, of course, is talking to, to, to writers, to, to poets. And he says, um, um, true ease in writing, for which I scribble out and put acting, True mm. ease in writing comes from art, not chance, as those move easiest who have learned to dance. And he goes on with wonderful um, descriptions. He says, um, when Ajax strives some rock's vast weight to throw, the line too labors and the words move slow, mm. Um, mm. which is a wonderful evocation mm. of just mm. how much um, direction Shakespeare's put into the text, really, to allow you to, to, f to find something that is beyond meaning, but enhances understanding, mm. I guess. Next, please. Yes, back there. Uh, very good question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I think the word uh, ensemble is already in uh, our title. I think it's basically the word company. Um, Michael Boyd and I disagreed on what the word ensemble meant um, in that we agreed on part of it, that it's a group that are brought together to share with, with a sort of shared community of ideas. That's m much easier if you're doing all the history plays, for instance, then clearly you're all on the, you know, on the same train. Um, but in terms of going back to, as it were, first principles of the RSC, when Peter Hall put a company together, which was to, 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 to be together for three years um, to do a particular period of, of work, um, they, they, you know, they did come together for three years, but it was a company led by Peggy Ashcroft and then Paul Schofield. Mm. And I think the leading of the ensemble was actually part of it, rather than as some kind of uh, democratized group, um, which I guess reflects, I don't guess that Burbage played many spear carriers um, <laughs> at the Globe. Um, and I think, though we agreed, I mean, I think what Michael did brilliantly was to extend the idea of ensemble, not just to the acting company, but through the entire RSC, because I think the investment that people feel, whether they're in the HR department, the IT department, wherever they are, with the RSC is much greater than it was a decade ago. So I think Ensemble can be, go beyond, as it were, the acting company. But 
my, I said my baseline is that you can't cast an ensemble. You can only grow an ensemble. And that growth comes from um, inviting and encouraging the, the investment of, of, of the team that you're working on so that you all want to, 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 for it to be the best that that particular group can do. There's no definitive Shakespeare. There's only the Shakespeare that this group provides in this moment now. Um, and I think that's, if you acknowledge that, that's what makes it so exciting. I remember feeling terrified about doing Hamlet and then realizing there is no definitive Hamlet. There can't be, there's no definitive text. Mm. You know, so you can't have a definitive Hamlet. Um, and when people say, oh, well, you must, you know, if you're, are you doing it all? Well, I guess the first time anybody did the whole of Hamlet, uh, as far as we know, is 1899 when Benson's company did the Hamlet, um, and they did up to the closet scene for the matinee and the rest of the play for the evening performance. Mm. And it was mm. known as the Eternity Hamlet. Mm. <laughs> um, so I, you know, they, Shakespeare certainly would never have seen, I, I'm absolutely sure, mm. would never have seen the full, the full Hamlet as it appears in the, in the, in the folio, um, or in the second quarter even. And I, I think, therefore, that every performance, let alone the actor's choices, the, the editing choices you make within the text. Just make it one of many Hamlets. Mm. Um, and there is no, no such thing as, as a definitive performance. Can't tell you how liberating that is to, to, to realize, it, although I realized it quite late in my career. <laughs> <laughs> More, yeah, Ema. Um, you were saying about um, how every artistic director of the RSC has kind of defined their tenure by doing the history. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, because you know, there are some, I don't think it's the right word, but any traditions you kind of feel like you need to uphold as artistic director, or do you kind of feel like there are some you need to break away from or to create new ones or something like that? I, I remember thinking that there shouldn't be a sort of house style that was imposed in some way. Um, but a, a, not very many years ago, a, a director worked for the company who insisted um, categorically that the iambic was not flexible and um, absolutely insisted on this with the company and some of the actors sort of went along with this idea um, in sooth I know not why I am so sad um, you know that's insisting on the iambic but then if you get the at the end of the scene where um, Lorenzo has just given this glorious picture of night and music and the stars and everything else um, and the reluctant um, uh, Jessica says I am never merry when I hear <laughs> sweet music <laughs> which is an absolutely <laughs> antithetical to the iambic it's trochaic isn't it it's 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 it, it t turns it completely up down it's like she's saying I don't know what the you're talking about. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it does it simply through by turning a regular iambic upside down. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the result of, of that director's um, dictatorial insistence um, meant that Cisberry and Michael Boyd and, and, and John Barton and I and Lynn Darnley got together and said, well, do we, do, we, do we sort of write a manifesto which says, look, the iambic is flexible. <laughs> and if you don't agree with that, don't come to the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and how far can you go? And if you do, well, you know, they'll remember it that year and then they'll have completely forgotten it by the following year anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think you can only lead from the front by doing what you want, mm -hmm. think is right, and, and encouraging others to, to, to follow that, that, that way of doing it. But mm -hmm. what you don't want to do is sort of make the whole thing some kind of homogenized approach to Shakespeare, because that would be... Uh, deathly. Yeah. I hope you'll all be back next week to hear more about verse speaking from uh, our very own Dr. Rockison, who sort of wrote the book on this. And, and yeah, you don't, we don't want to see King Lear saying, Neveu, 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 do you? But I, yes, I have to say, yeah. Charles, Charles yeah. Lawton yeah. insisted to Peter Hall that it was Neveu, Neveu, Neveu. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, there may be time for more before tea. Emily? Um, has somehow influenced how you direct them? Would you recommend that to other directors? 
I wouldn't recommend many of my fellow directors to, to, to play Lady Macbeth, no. Um, I, I suppose this is quite, uh, you know, I, I, I've never really thought of transforming my own experience into sort of general rules, so I can only talk personally mm. about, about how I felt. Um, I think growing up as, uh, you know, as a gay man in, in, in Lancashire, as a, as a schoolboy at a Catholic school in Lancashire, um, the, the, the opportunity of, play, of playing Lady Macbeth and kind of hiding in public mm. um, was, was very liberating. But also, somehow, I felt that my perspective on the world was entirely different from the group of people around me. And it, yet it felt to be peculiarly Shakespearean in that Shakespeare always seemed to take the position of the outsider and watch what everybody else was doing. And maybe that's why he wrote such great parts for women, uh, you know, great uh, understanding of uh, Othello or Shylock or, or Rosalind. Um, and I, I don't know, I've never formulated that into some kind of theory other than knowing that from my own experience, I felt somehow um, you know, when, when Lady, I used, to, I used to walk the dog at night um, uh, in Longton, just outside Preston where we, where we lived, and we, we'd go down the, the sort of stream, a little path by the stream, and, I, and there was a field with cows in it, and I would walk around as Lady Macbeth shouting these lines, <laughs> uh, and feeling, you know, I, I, I remember shouting, unsex me here to a cow. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't an invitation to that particular fusion, but it, <laughs> it, 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 was, a, it was liberating. It, it was a sense, you know, I understood what, what the kind of, rip, what, what Lady M is kind of holding back, you know, what she's holding in, uh, underneath, um, and which comes out so kind of volcanically or so destructively to her own mentality. Um, whether that's a general, whether that turns into a general rule about about Shakespeare, I, I don't know. My own experience seemed to attest that he knew um, humanity from 360 degrees. Whether whether that was the female psyche, uh, what a black man felt in that society, what a Jew felt in that society, or, or what a gay man felt in that society. Mm. Mm. Um, Eve. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you have any kind of predetermined idea of the structure or order in which you do that. Um, it'll probably be, it's a, it's a five year plan. It, I, I, I wanted to say it was going to be a six year plan, but I was told that five is a prime number and nobody responds to the left, the word number six. <laughs> <laughs> um, six years is, is actually more cogent, but a five-year plan sounds better. They did a five-year plan at the old Vic um, hmm. in the 1950s um, and did them all in that time. Um, it's partially not to go, hey, we're going to all, all of Shakespeare, because frankly, you'd expect us to. <laughs> um, <coughs> you know, we, we, nor are we going to do them in chronological order, though we, will, we are going to, in fact, uh, in 2014, start with many of the, the early plays. We're going to do Two Gentlemen of Rome. This is unknown yet, so if it spills out, I'll know it came from this room. <laughs> um, Two Gentlemen of Verona has not been in full production on the main stage of Stratford for 45 years. Mm -hmm. We've done it several times, but mm -hmm. on the main mm -hmm. stage, mm -hmm. not for 45 years. Um, so we, the, 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 the reason that I feel confident to propose a five-year plan is partially the three-year plan that Shakespeare plonks on our plate, 450th birthday to uh, death, the qu centenary of his death. Um, but also because, because I have now directed, I guess, somewhere between half and two thirds of the, of the canon, I know which plays I still want to do, and know to some extent when the actors that I want to do them with are available, uh, and some actors have a much longer, like opera singers, have a much longer you know, diary now than they used to. So I can provide a spine of, of ones I know that we're going to be doing this here, here, and here, which allows the spine, if you like, allows spontaneity. Um, it can be, you know, I'm much more flexible elsewhere. But we are going to theme certain plays, um, group certain plays, correspond certain plays occasionally with an, an odd anniversary or, or whatever. Um, and what I hope to do is, is, is provide 
moments when the plays have a greater context, um, if, either by their Jacobean repertoire or, or, or Jacobethan repertoire, to use that hated word, mm -hmm. um, or indeed um, look at plays that connect in some other way. Um, uh, to, you know, I, I think it'd be very interesting when, when, we, when we do Henry V to, to look at Troilus and Cressida in the same breath. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. Shakespeare's two polar attitudes to war seemingly expressed in those two plays, or are they? Mm -hmm. um, and then alongside that, it would be, I've always thought, with, alongside Troilus and Cressida, it would be very interesting to look at you know, either the Trojan women or Hecuba or one mm -hmm. of the plays, mm -hmm. or one of the Greek plays written about that iconic um, moment in history. And a few years ago, um, I, was, I, I went to Turkey with my, my partner. We were standing on the, uh, the, the ramparts of Hisarlik, which is meant to be ancient Troy. And I was kind of working out what was where and <laughs> thinking, is this, that must be where Simoeus was, mm -hmm. and that must be the island of Tenedos where the mm -hmm. ships went. And I said to the guide who was with us, what's that over there, over the strait of water over there? And he said, well, the straits are the Dardanelles. And I thought, of course they're the Dardanelles. So what's that? that piece of land over there. What's that monument that I can see sticking up? Mm. He says, that's Gallipoli. Mm. And I thought, mm. God, from, from, from the, the site of the, the, the icon of ancient warfare, you can see one of the most uh, appalling outrages of the First World War in mm. sight of ancient mm. Troy. Mm. So with, with, in fact, the centenary of Gallipoli coming up to do Gallipoli along, to do a play about Gallipoli, maybe alongside looking at Henry V, Troilus and Cressida, Trojan women, whatever, then, then those, those, those sort of ideas begin to collect, if you like, or, or gather. Um, and then lo and behold, uh, as I was pondering this thought, onto my desk arrived a new play, Gallipoli, <laughs> by Charles Wood. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> amazing. So that sometimes these, these things are in the air and you just have to articulate them. Good. Well, I think what's in the air at the moment impending in this strange, eerie, uncanny way is a tea break, <laughs> right, when we all get tea. Uh, but before we reward uh, Greg at market rate with a cup of tea and a biscuit, um, I think we should thank him for sharing this with us this afternoon. And And we're, 